All right, this morning we are going to take a break from 1 Peter. As I was praying about my message this week, I was thinking about Mother's Day coming up. And as many of you know, I have three brand new grandchildren in the last month. And I've been watching a couple of those mothers and other mothers take care of children as well as fathers. I'm not saying that the job is any easier for them, but being a mother is a, is a huge responsibility. And I was reading in Proverbs chapter 31 this morning, looking at all of the things that the Bible says defines a good mother. And I read that last verse this morning where a good mother fears the Lord. It's that one that fears the Lord that shall be praised. And as an example, uh, my mind went to Hannah. And you probably know the story of Hannah, but we're going to read that this morning. So if you go to 1 Samuel chapter 1, 1 Samuel chapter 1, Hannah was Samuel's mother. You know Samuel was a great prophet of God, a prophet of Israel, one of the last judges of Israel, and left a huge legacy for the nation to follow the Lord, but his life was impacted by his mother, Hannah. And so this morning, I want to read chapter 1 of 1 Samuel so we can review again the story of Hannah, and then there's several lessons that we can learn from her life, not just for mothers, but for all of us as believers. So starting at verse 1 of 1 Samuel, Chapter 1, we're going to read that whole chapter in this account of Hannah. It says, Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim, and I'm going to test you on that one at the end, Ramathaith Zophim, of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, and an Ephrathite. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he, came to Penina, he gave to Penina his wife and to all her sons and daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her sore, for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so, year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah to her, her husband to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by the post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken, And Eli said unto her, How long will thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. And they rose up early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. 
Wherefore, it came to pass when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. And the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah went not up, for she said to her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. And Elkanah her husband said unto her, Do what seemeth good to thee. Tarry until thou hast weaned him, only the Lord establish his word. So the woman abode and gave her son suck until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed. And the Lord has given me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Let's take a minute and pray, and then we'll look at these lessons God has for us today. Our Father, we know that your word is truth. Jesus said your word is truth. And it's been given to us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so all that we read here is inspired by you and it's profitable for us to learn from. And so, Lord, as we look at this example of a godly woman and faithful mother, I pray that you would show us the things that can be applied in our lives as we follow you as well. Lord, I pray that you would take your word and teach it to us and grain it in our hearts. And may your spirit use us to make us more in the image of your son. And Father, now give me your spirit. Fill me with your spirit. Give me strength and wisdom. Give me words to speak so that your truth might be proclaimed today. And through all, we give you the glory. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Many of us probably are familiar with the story of Hannah, a mother or a woman married but without children. And we know the struggle that she went through for a mother in Israel to not have children or a wife in Israel to not have children was looked at as kind of a curse uh, because childbearing was kind of the biggest accomplishment that an Israelite woman could have. Now, going all the way back to Eve, remember when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden and God applied the curse of sin to them and to the earth, one of the things that God added to that curse was the promise of a redeemer. And so from Eve on up, especially once we get past Sarah and into the Jewish nation, all mothers who were Jewish were looking forward to that promised Messiah, and every single one of them hoped that their son would be that Messiah. And so to have no children was probably the worst thing that could happen to any Jewish wife at this point. And so we see Hannah in this situation. Now we have to point this out, that God is the one who closed her womb. The Bible says that twice in this passage. God is the one who prevented her from having children. There was nothing physically wrong with her or her husband. It was just that God had decided for her not to have children up to this point. And so Hannah prays with all her heart. And it's not just one prayer, it's a continuous prayer that God would give her a child. Now, part of the struggle is not just that she didn't have children. Part of her struggle is that her husband, seeing that she didn't have children, married another wife. Hannah was probably the first wife. And uh, Penina probably was the second, because Hannah didn't have children. Elkanah wanted children, and so he married another wife, Penina, and she bore him children. But Hannah, uh, Elkanah loved Hannah more, even though he didn't, or she didn't give him children. But Penina, because she had children and Hannah didn't, mocked her mercilessly and relentlessly. And that made this burden that Hannah had to bear even harder. And so you see the struggle that Hannah was in for much, many years of her life as a married woman. No children to show for it. And that's what we read here in the first chapter of 1 Samuel. 
And this is the story of how God gave Hannah Samuel in answer to her prayer. Now, there's lots of lessons that we can learn by reading this, and many of them are very apparent. Obviously, the biggest one, that God will answer our prayers. I'm not going to focus on that, but today I want to look at some lessons that aren't as apparent, but they're still as important for us, not just as mothers and parents, but as believers, things that we see in the character of Hannah as a faithful follower of the Lord and how she approached this and how she lived even in this dire circumstance that she was in. All three of these lessons come from things that Hannah did not do or did not let herself give in to. And so I want to focus on those things this morning as we look at her response to these overwhelming circumstances. First, What you will not find here is that Hannah did not let abuse from others cause her to complain. There are no complaints in these verses from Hannah. She never talks openly with anyone about the struggles that she in or complains about the abuse that she receives at the hand of others. Now, I already talked about the problem that she had this childless state that she was in, that God allowed her to be in, put her in a situation that affected her standing in the community, it affected her honor in her family, and it even affected her own sense of purpose in her own life. As I said, for a woman in Jerusalem, the highest honor was to get married and have a son especially. And she did not have that. And then she was mocked by her arch rival because of it. And that's why Penina mocked her. Now remember, Penina was probably the second wife. And coming in after the fact, Penina kind of felt like leftovers, if you will. And so she had to, in her own mind, build herself up somehow. She was the one that was able to provide children to her husband. And so she mocked Hannah, relentlessly, about the fact that, oh, you're the first wife, but you can't have children. I'm the better wife because I have children and you don't. And you get the idea that Hannah had to listen to this day in and day out. The, the, the sorest grievance in her life, and now I mean, we, we call it pouring salt on the wound. This was not pouring salt on the wound. This was like Penina taking a machete and slicing it and then pouring alcohol into the wounds. Okay, that's how much of a grievance it was for Hannah to not have children. Now, I want to make one note here because here we have an account of Elkanah practicing polygamy. He takes more than one wife. And there are several instances in Scripture where you see polygamy happen. But in every instance in Scripture where you see more than one wife taken by a man, you will never find an example of God condoning it, and there are always problems that result from it. And here we see one of those problems is the mocking that comes between or from the one wife to the other wife. You think of another example, I mean, a very apparent one, Abraham. Abraham was promised by God to have a son, the promised son Isaac, in his old age. Both he and Sarah were past childbearing age, and yet God promised they would have a son. And so they waited, and they waited, and they waited, and there was no son. And so Abraham and Sarah took it upon themselves, basically, to have that son. And Sarah suggested Abraham take her handmaiden, Hagar, and he did. And Hagar had a son, and his name was Ishmael. Now, that was a blessing from the Lord, as all children are. The Bible tells us that children are an heritage from the Lord. So Ishmael was a blessing, but it was not the promised son that God had promised Abraham. Abraham went outside of God's plan, and Ishmael was born. And we know later Isaac was born. He was the son of promise. But as I mentioned, polygamy never gives a good result. And if you know anything about history, Ishmael was blessed by God, became a great nation, and that nation now is what we call the Arab nations of the Middle East. 
And from the beginning of their existence, they have been a thorn in the side to Israel and tormented and tortured and persecuted them relentlessly. It did not end up well. We probably have the greatest controversy between two nations in the history of this world because Abraham chose to take a second wife and have a child outside of his first marriage, apart from the promise of God. So here we have an example in Hannah's life of one wife taunting another wife for her childless state. That was not God's plan for Elkanah. Elkanah should have waited on God. Otherwise, he was a what we'll call a godly and spiritual man, but I believe he made this one mistake. And it caused Hannah this severe distress in her life beyond the distress she already had because she was childless. But here's the point. Even in the midst of all of that, we never see an instance of Hannah complaining. Now, you would think if you were in that situation, and hopefully none of you ever will be or are at this moment, but if you were in a situation and you were Hannah, who would you go complain to? Elkanah, your husband, right? He married this woman. He was the cause of the problem. He needs to get her in line. And so all she had to do was go to Elkanah, her husband, and say, she keeps mocking me because I can't have children, and it's not my choice. That's God's choice. She shouldn't do that. Can you talk to her? But Elkanah didn't even know about it because Hannah never complained. And we know that because in verse 8, it says, Elkanah, her husband, said, Hannah, why weepest thou? Why eatest thou not? He didn't know what was bothering her. He knew she was without children, and that was an issue for her. But he had no idea about this mocking going on. And he says to her, why are you so sad? We've talked about this childless thing. We know it's from God. Am I not better than ten sons to thee? He was a great husband to her. He loved her. But he never heard about the mocking because she never complained. This is a great lesson for all of us to learn. And if you continue as we read this passage, the only time you see the word complaint in all of this account of Hannah's trial is when she's standing before Eli trying to explain her situation when she was praying silently and he thought she was drunk. And she said, no, I poured out my complaint to the Lord. Now, that's the way we ought to do things. If we have a problem or a situation that causes us distress, people aren't going to fix that. Only God can fix that. And so the only one that we should, in a sense, complain to is God. And it's not really even a complaint. We shouldn't complain because the Bible tells us do all things without murmuring and disputing. We shouldn't complain about everything, anything. In fact, in everything we should give thanks. But Hannah uses the word complaint. And the word complaint here doesn't mean I'm complaining to God. What it means is I'm pouring out my anxiety and what's causing me distress to the Lord because he's the only one that can fix it. We need to learn that lesson. Hannah's a great example for us there. Now, if we just restrict our trials to the trials that we have between family members, I think that would be enough for most of us. Because God puts us into a family so that we can learn to get along with people that seemingly hate us, right? Right? Seems that way a lot of times, especially siblings, okay? I remember growing up, I have two brothers and one sister. I got along with my sister fine. Most of the time, I got along with my older brother. My younger brother is a year younger than me, and we are like the odd couple. We are as opposite as you can get. And we had to share a room for 19 years. We literally had to do the tape down the middle. This is your side. This is my side. Stay over there. Okay? And so I know what it means to have turmoil between family members. Now, I didn't get taunted and mocked like Hannah did. Maybe you get taunted and mocked. Maybe you have problems in relationships with people in your family or other people outside of your family. Is complaining to people about those broken relationships going to help anything? The answer is no. The only one who can fix that is God, because God is the only one who can fix people. We can't change people, 
but God can change us. Hannah understood that. And so the only place she went to with her complaints was to the Lord, the one who could solve her problems in the first place. She understood that God was in control of the situation. God was even in control of allowing this mocking to be part of her life. And so the only place she could go to complain or pour out her heart and anxiety was to the Lord. But how often do we try to find relief by gossiping or complaining to other people about people instead of going to God, who's the one who can fix those people? And usually the problem is not with the other people. Usually the problem is with us anyway. Well, that's how Hannah approached this issue. She didn't complain. She prayed. Praying is the answer to the problems you have, not just with people, but any problems you have. Because God is the only one that can fix those problems for you. So this is how Hannah approached this issue. This is how we should approach our problems as well. Knowing that God has allowed those situations for a reason in our life. God is the only one who can provide a solution to those situations. And God has a purpose in it all. So instead of complaining, pray. Because God has the answer for it. So we see, first of all, Hannah did not complain. She did not let the abuse from other people make her complain or lead her to complain. Not even to her husband. Instead, she prayed. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two, she did not let the lack of spirituality in others deter her from worshiping God. Now, we see several examples of people in this account of people who should be spiritual but are otherwise not, okay? We already read, or we read in verse 3, that Elkanah went up to the tabernacle at Shiloh every year. Now, right away in our minds, if you know anything about the Old Testament Scripture, we think, well, Shiloh, that's not where the temple is. The temple's in Jerusalem. This is before the temple, remember? And in fact, this is when they worshipped at, at, at the tabernacle, before the temple was built. And at this point in Israel's history, the tabernacle was in a city called Shiloh before Jerusalem became the capital and the center of worship. So Shiloh is where the tabernacle was. And so every year, Elkanah would take his family, his wives and his children. They would all go to the temple according to the law and offer these offerings of thanksgiving and praise to God. Now, based on the description And what we see in this passage, these sacrifices that they made were probably peace offerings that are described in Deuteronomy chapter 16. Because as they offer these offerings, the Bible tells us that Elkanah offered to Penina a portion, but then he gave to Hannah a double portion. So what he's describing is this thanksgiving offering or or praise offering to God. And what they would do is they would take a, a bowl or a ram, and they would offer it on the altar, but they would cut it up in such a way that only certain parts were offered for the sacrifice. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 16, it says that the breast and the right shoulder, those parts were actually given to the priest, and so the priest would eat from them. The fat was burned on the fire, and then the rest of the offering belonged to the person who brought it. And so they would offer the animal, the animal would be cut up, part would be given to the priest, the blood would be poured out of the foot of the altar, the fat would be burned on the altar, and then the family would take the rest of that animal and cook it, and they would eat it together in thanksgiving to God. This is all described in Deuteronomy. And so that's probably what was happening here with Elkanah. And so as they had that meal, he would separate those parts out after it was cooked and give a portion to each of his family members. Now, in this culture, the honored guest would always receive the biggest portion. And so Elkanah honored Hannah in that way by giving her a double portion. It showed his love for her. So this is the sacrifice and the worship that we see happening here. But also in verse 3, as they go to Shiloh, we're given a little tidbit of information that doesn't seem to matter a whole lot until you understand why it's there. Look at verse 3 at the very end. It says, And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, 
The priests of the Lord were there. Well, if they're going to worship at the tabernacle, you would expect the priest to be at the tabernacle, right? But we don't know yet much about Hophni and Phinehas. But it's given to us um, a better description in chapter 2, because chapter 2, verse 12, tells us about these two sons of Eli. And it says, now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. That's a word for Satan in Scripture. And then it says, they knew not the Lord. Now, we could apply that probably to many people that we know. They seem to be children of the devil. They obviously don't know God based on the way they live. But that description here is applied to the priests in the house of God. Now, you think about that. Every year, Elkanah would take his family to go worship at the tabernacle to offer these sacrifices, and the two priests running the place were these two guys, Hophni and Phinehas, sons of Belial, who knew not the Lord. It should be just the opposite. These should be the most spiritual people in the land, and it isn't. They are the worst of the land. They are the most unspiritual people that we read about in the beginning of 1 Samuel. And they are priests in God's house. Now, if you keep reading in chapter 2, you'll find out that not only were they priests, but they were underhanded bullies who forced people to violate God's directions for these offerings that they brought so that they could get what they wanted. Now, I already explained that the priests would get certain portions in some of the sacrifices that were offered, the, the sacrifice was put into a big pot of water or into a cauldron, and as that meat w or was being boiled, the priests were allowed, according to the law, to take a three-pronged hook and to cast it into the pot and then draw it out. And whatever meat came out on that hook, that belonged to the priest. That's how they ate. Hophni and Phinehas did not like boiled meat. And so what they did was they forced people, before they brought their offering, to cut portions off and bring it to them raw. And if you read chapter 2, basically if people didn't do that, then they threatened them. That's not the ideal picture of a priest to me. In fact, that's just the opposite of what we expect a priest to be. Sounds like more like our pop politicians of today. Okay, many of them, because they have to get their part first. And that's how Hophni and Phinehas were. So not spiritual people at all. Now let me ask you a question, knowing what you know now, just a little bit about Hophni and Phinehas. If these two guys were the pastors of your church, would you keep going? Probably not. And yet, because God told Israel... You will go to Shiloh, you will worship at the temple, you will offer these offerings. Elkanah took his family every single year, and they obeyed the Lord. Here's an important point. Hannah didn't have to go. We know that because after God gives Hannah Samuel, in verse 22, after Samuel's born, remember Elkanah, says, okay, we're going to go to the house of the Lord, we're going to worship, we're going to sacrifice, we're going to praise God. And Hannah says, I want you to go without me. I have Samuel here, I'm going to keep him home until he's ready to go serve in the temple. So she had the choice about whether to go or not. And yet before God gave her Samuel, she went every single year. She went into the same tabernacle where Hophni and Phinehas were in charge, she prayed to the Lord. She offered sacrifices of thanksgiving for what? For God's goodness. Even though she didn't have children. Even though they had to worship at a tabernacle that was run by corrupt men. Even though they had to, she, she had to endure bullies in church and bullies at home. Unspiritual people did not stop her from worshiping the Lord as God expected her to. She didn't have to go, but she chose to go. 
And so neither the taunting from Penina nor the corruption of the priests could deter her or stop her from worshiping the Lord faithfully. She didn't use the lack of spirituality or corruption of others to stop her from doing what she knows she should do. Now, what about us? Do we ever use others as an excuse to not worship the Lord as we know we should? You know the old excuse, right? I'm not going to that church because that church is full of hypocrites. Well, here's the truth of the matter. Anybody who chooses to use that excuse why they don't go to church, they should probably go because they'll fit right in. If we choose those kind of excuses why we don't go to church and meet with God's people and worship the Lord like he wants us to, then we are the hypocrite. We're not going to change the church by going there. But God has instructed us to meet together as believers. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, the, the author says, Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. That means we are commanded to meet together, to worship together in person. And by the way, watching on the internet doesn't count as worshiping together. I'm not saying you can't hear a great message over the internet or hear good music that praises God over the internet, but you cannot experience the fellowship that God intends for us by staying home. And if we use other people as the excuse why we don't go to church, we're not only robbing others of our presence, but we're robbing ourselves of the blessing that God wants to give us in being together with God's people. In fact, in, in Hebrews 10, it says, not so you can enjoy worship, it says that you can exhort one another. You can't exhort someone from home. You can only do that in person. As the New Testament church, God has put us together so that we can edify each other and build one another up. That's his purpose. And as we do that, then we're able to take the gospel and live the gospel outside of this because we know we have a whole group of people praying for us and rooting for us and, and beseeching God on our behalf and encouraging us to do what's right. Without that fellowship, we're lost. We're loners. We don't have that strength. And that's why the writer of Hebrews tells us we should be meeting together regularly. Don't forsake that opportunity. Now, it's interesting, in Hebrews, the writer says that, and he says, so that you can exhort one another, and then immediately after that, in verses 26 and 27, he says this, For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Now, I don't know specifically if the writer of Hebrews, under the inspiration of God, was saying that specific sin of ignoring getting together with believers, ignoring the fellowship of the believers together in person, is worthy of the judgment of God in fiery indignation. Maybe there's a broader context there, but it comes right after forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. As far as I'm concerned, I don't think I'd want to take a chance of offending God. I don't think I'd want to take the chance of, if I don't meet together as God has told me to, and go to church and fellowship with other believers and encourage them in his word, there's fiery indignation waiting for me. I wouldn't even want to take the risk. But there's blessing that we can get from being together as God's people. We're at least missing that. And there's blessing that we can give to each other as meaning with God's people. And if we use, oh, well, that church is full of hypocrites, or, well, that person offended me, or that person says they're Christian, but they live this way, and, oh, you know, they're, they're high up in the church and everybody respects them, but I know what they're like out in normal day, everyday life. If we use other people as the, as the reason or excuse why we don't do what God has told us to do, then we are the hypocrites. Hannah was in a much worse situation than any of us will ever be in. 
and yet she did not let that deter her from worshiping God every year. She was faithful in that. And so she's a great example of faithfulness in worship despite the sinfulness and corruption of the people that she had to engage with on a regular basis. That's the second lesson. The third lesson is this. Hannah did not let the sinfulness of others deter her from keeping her promises and obligations to God. In verse 11, it shows Hannah's vow. It gives us that vow. It says, She vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou will indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Hannah basically promised God in that prayer that if he gave her a son, he would give her son back to the Lord to serve the Lord for his entire life. And that's exactly what happened. But she also adds in this vow to the Lord that no razor would come upon his head. The indication there is that she was dedicating him to God as a Nazarite. Now, the Nazarite vow basically was a vow that someone would make to God where they would dedicate themselves to serve the Lord for a certain period of time in their lives. During that time, according to the Old Testament, they would not drink anything that had alcohol in it or anything that came from the vine, including grape juice. They would not cut their hair, and they would not touch anything that was dead. That way they would show their dedication to the Lord and their purity. Now, in doing that, they would also show that they were living completely differently from everybody else in the culture. Okay, that was not the normal thing. It was not normal for men to have long hair, even back in the Old Testament. The Nazarite vow made them different that way. It was normal to drink grape juice or wine. They did not do that. That made them different. And many people had to touch dead animals in order to cook them. They wouldn't even do that. So obviously, when you took a Nazarite vow, you were different than everybody around you. We have a couple examples. Samson was supposed to be a Nazarite his entire life. He violated that vow several times. John the Baptist. God told his parents, he's going to be separated to me, and so he lived that way his entire life. And here, Hannah, Samuel's mother, is dedicating Samuel before he's born, saying, Lord, I'm going to give him to you. He will be different than everyone else, and everyone will know that his life in its entirety is dedicated to serving you, not just in the temple, but in everything that he does. And that's the vow that Hannah made. And God answered her prayer and gave her a son. And his name was Samuel, as we know. But Samuel didn't immediately go to the tabernacle to serve. As I mentioned before, Hannah decided to keep him home and to raise him up, to teach him. Remember the situation that he was going to be going into. Hannah saw what happened at the tabernacle. Hannah saw the example of Hophni and Phinehas and the corruption that was there. And she knew when she took Samuel to that tabernacle to serve, those men would be there as an influence over him. And so for three or four years, she dedicated, to, to teaching, she dedicated herself to teaching Samuel everything that he needed to know to follow God in this vow. But she did not let the presence of Hophni and Phinehas, two absolutely corrupt priests, sons of Belial, keep her from fulfilling her promise to give her son back to the Lord. Now, you put, put yourself, especially you mothers, put yourself in Hannah's situation. If you made that kind of promise to God and then saw the kind of people that he, your son would be around for the rest of his life, you might second think that promise, right? You'd be like, well, Lord, you know, I, I didn't realize it was that bad. You understand, right, God? You understand that's not good for my son. We don't see excuses here from Hannah. 
we see an absolute commitment to follow through on what she vowed to God, despite the corruption that he would be exposed to, and the fact that he would not be home. He lived at the tabernacle, and he was probably three or four years old when she took him and left him there. I'm sure Hannah had some level of anxiety about this as a mother. Any mother would. But just like the situation of being childless, she didn't complain about it. She didn't talk about it. She didn't, it doesn't say she second thought her promise to God or doubted what God was going to do or anything. She followed through because of her trust in God's power and God's authority. God was in control. And so even as she took her young son at three or four years old to the tabernacle where these corrupt men were in charge, she trusted God's control to keep him pure, to help him to grow up as a faithful servant of the Lord, and that's exactly what happened. Hannah knew all too well what dangers and influences existed in Shiloh, where she was about to leave her son, but she also knew that she would not make a vow or obligation to the Lord and then break it. There's worse in breaking a vow to the Lord than there is in the doubts and anxiety of leaving her son there. And as it turns out, God didn't only take care of Samuel, but he raised him up to be a godly man. Not just a godly man, but he became one of the greatest prophets of Israel. And the last and best judge of the nation. They say that 90% of a child's upbringing is their environment. I disagree. 90% of a child's upbringing is the influence of their parents in the work that God can do in their lives. Samuel is a perfect example of that. Hannah had three or four years with him, and God used that three or four years to infuse in him everything he needed to know for the rest of his life, to remain faithful. Samuel, as a great prophet, started what was called the Sons of the Prophets. It was a school to teach young men how to serve the Lord faithfully, even in a corrupt nation. And that school of the prophets lasted for hundreds of years after Samuel died as a legacy to his faithfulness to the Lord. Remember, it was Samuel who anointed King Saul against his own concerns because he knew that Israel should not have a king because God was their king. But God told Samuel, go ahead, give the people what they want. They deserve it. And so he did. But it was also Samuel that God allowed to anoint King David, a much better king, a man after God's own heart. And so you see the legacy that Samuel has in Israel's history and the example of his life for us to learn from, but it all starts with his mother's commitment to follow the Lord and follow through on her commitments to the Lord, regardless of the corruption that was around her. She understood the truth of greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And this is before the Holy Spirit indwelt believers. She kept her promise to the Lord despite the apparent danger to her son, and the abject wickedness of those that Samuel might be exposed to. So here's the question, what about us? Do we use the corruption in our government or in our churches as an excuse not to do what we know is right? And I'm not talking just about coming to church, I'm talking about living our lives in faithfulness. Our government is already in the process of crafting laws that will target Christians and pastors and churches. It may be in our lifetimes that we start to be persecuted and jailed and put to death possibly because of our faith. But the question is, are we going to, like like Hannah, going to be faithful in our commitment to the Lord regardless of the corruption that surrounds us? 
Are we going to serve the Lord in faithfulness even though everybody else around us is doing just the opposite? She trusted God to keep his promises, and that became the sole consideration that she had in obeying the Lord. And that should be our sole consideration in obeying the Lord in our lives as well. It doesn't matter what other people are like. It doesn't matter what other people do. God holds each of us accountable for our actions and for our responsibility to him. End of story. And when we get to heaven, we're not going to be able to stand before him and say, but what about them? But look what they did. But you didn't think about what they did to me. And God's going to say, didn't I tell you I'd be with you? Didn't I tell you I'd provide your needs? Didn't I tell you I'd give you strength? All I asked is for you to be faithful and obey. There are no excuses when we get to heaven. Hannah didn't use any excuses. She faithfully followed her commitments to the Lord. So let me ask you this as we close. What keeps you from filling your obligations to the Lord? What excuses, what circumstances do you use as deterrents that keep you from doing what you know you should be doing as a follower of Jesus Christ? Do you walk around useless to God because you're complaining about how everybody else is treating you and offending you and hurting you? Are you a victim? Or do you quietly and faithfully endure Trusting the only one who could fix the problems to keep you going, to provide for you and give you the strength? Do you fail in faithful worship of the Lord and in joining together with God's people because everybody else at your church is less than perfect? Or do you go to the Lord's house faithfully, praying that God might use even you to help those people draw closer to God? And do you fail in your obligations to the Lord because of the corruption that abounds all around us? Or, like Hannah, do you simply obey God, trusting him completely, because God is bigger and stronger than any powers or any influence that is out there in this world today? Hannah is a very simple housewife, eventually a faithful mother, And actually, other than this record we have in Scripture, she's not a very famous person. She did no great deeds in the world's perspective. There's nothing to make her noteworthy in history, except God included her in his book so that we might see what a faithful mother and a faithful believer looks like in everyday life. God has given us her story to teach us faithfulness, and obedience to show us that it's not always grand, it's not always pretty, it's not always fun, but it always receives the blessing of God. And sometimes it's just living the simple life that God has given you, trusting him to help you endure the suffering and trials that you have to go through, being faithful in doing the little things in your life that he has called you to do, in your job, in your family, in your church, in your neighborhood, wherever he has placed you. It's the little moments of life that define you, not the big events. And for Hannah, it was those little moments of faithfulness that provide a perfect example of what our everyday faith should look like as we go through the struggles of living. She is a simple Jewish mother, simple everyday problems, but what an example to all of us to learn what faithfulness looks like and what trust in God looks like as we live our everyday life. Are you going to be a Hannah? Or are you going to be something else? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your word, for your example, and for this faithful mother that provides a great example to all of us. Lord, as we even compare ourselves to Hannah's faithfulness, many of us have failed even that test. And so we know we fail in the test of your calling 
to us to be holy in all that we do, to be faithful in obeying you in everything, and to be thankful in our spirit in everything and through everything, because you are good and you mean it for good for us. So please forgive us for our failing in the little things in our lives. And I ask that you would just give us strength, and I pray that you would give us this truth today, help it to become ingrained in us, so that it becomes a foundation of the motivation we have every day in getting up in doing the little things faithfully, in serving you, in being your witnesses, in giving you praise and the honor that you deserve in, as we live our, our lives each day. Lord, we can only do it with your help and through your strength, so help us to submit ourselves to you so that you can receive the glory through us as you've intended. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is 344, I Must Tell Jesus. I chose this hymn.